Welcome to Critical Issues, Alternative Views. I'm Ron Kramer, Professor of Sociology at Western Michigan University, and I serve as the host of the program. Joining me today are our two regular Viewmeisters. On my right is Denise Keel. Uh, Denise is a professor in the uh, Political Science mm -hmm. Department at Western Michigan University. She also is affiliated with the uh, Institute for Sustain of Sustainability and the Environment. Pretty close, yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is the best and joke. I, yeah, I, I'd never get it straight. And uh, Denise also chairs the Climate Change Working Group at Western Michigan University. Uh, on my left is uh, Don Cooney. Don is a professor over in the School of Social Work at Western. And uh, Don is also a city commissioner in Kalamazoo, longstanding. Uh, very involved in a number of important projects at the city that we hope to get to uh, today on the program. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to start off today by talking about uh, the recent summit that was held between President Trump and, uh, and uh, Kim Jong-un yep. uh, and uh, about the uh, North Korean situation in Singapore. And uh, Denise, what was your take on the uh, the summit? Yeah, well, it happened. It happened. <laughs> we yes. weren't so sure, but we, we talked so about sure. this about a month ago, I think, That's right. Right. Program, right. and we weren't really sure if this mm -mm. was going to come off, and in fact, it did. It, it did, so. and, and our, our timing is just spot on here again. So I think most of our uh, predictions b before this w happened probably bore out. Um, my read is not a lot happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a, absolutely historic. These two countries, we've never met before. Um, but there's a commitment to denuclearize when, how. When, where, how. Where, <laughs> how. You know, a lot of uh, big, a lot of old ideas, right? Mm -hmm. There's not, that, not a lot of new there um, and just a lot of uh, promises. And of course, the U.S. has agreed to provide some sort of security provisions to, to lessen our military exercises which, uh, you know, some of the interviews I saw with some of the uh, troops who stand on that border every night, right? Their motto is ready to fight tonight. Wow. So how does that then impact the presence that we do have uh, there and these guys that are standing on, on that wall, basically? So my read is lots of empty promises mm -hmm. would be the big picture takeaway. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, what did you guys say? Don, what was your well, take on um, I heard a commentator the other day say that, that Kim really won because what he got was two days out of North Korea. That's true. So that was really good for him. But, um, you know, the New York Times, I was telling Ron yesterday, they have a, 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 they published this week, okay, if there's going to be disarmament, yeah. here are the nine steps that have to go on. That's right. And there are such intricate steps right. along the line that will take years, years. to mm -hmm. accomplish and extremely difficult because mm -hmm. of all the possible places where they have hidden these things and everything. So yeah. until we get some of that, I find myself um, having to give Trump credit for trying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's hard for me, <laughs> yes. because, but I do give him credit for, for trying. Right. And I think that's good. But the detail, that, as you said, Denise, that's the true. lack of detail and the lack of identification of what are the next steps, that's really the gap here. That's right. It is interesting. I share your uh, same, you know, it's hard to get those words out sometimes. <laughs> but I thought, well, when uh, Obama, when he was running for president, said I would uh, agree to meet with some of these leaders, uh, immediately he was attacked as being weak and, you know, why would we ever do these things, right? And here Trump is out there doing it, and of course it's the best thing ever. But I do agree talking uh, to these to folks, right, is always something that we, we should be willing to do. Now again, right, the flip side of that is this is one of the worst uh, human rights violators, oh, yeah. uh, dictators, <sighs> terrible regimes in the whole world. Why even give them the time of day, which that was the argument that we've now given credibility uh, to a regime and probably Kim has one because he can go back and say, look, I'm now acknowledged. I, I'm i uh, working to normalize rela our relations in the world and see they all think I'm a great guy now and that I think is a winning strategy uh, for him staying in control of a regime that we know is harmful to its people. Terrible, mm -hmm. terrible. Yeah. Sort of a Nixon goes to China movement. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, no Democratic president could have done what Nixon did probably no. at that time. No, I don't think opening so. Opening up right. uh, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, channels with uh, China. Donna, you remember 
it was red China, right? When we were yeah, younger, exactly. you never talked about China. It was always no, red, red China. China. And that <laughs> mm -hmm. was very, very uh, specific. So, yeah. you know, because Nixon had cover, political cover, because right. he had the anti-communist credentials, he could uh, do that, where yeah. a Democratic president would immediately have been attacked as weak right. and right. Uh, Neville Chamberlain and yeah. all that. Yes. That's oh, exactly. Yes. Exactly. So Trump was sort of in the same in position. The same. Right. If Obama had done this, the right wing would have gone crazy, right. mm -hmm. and again, he would have been weak and uh, giving yeah. in and all this. But if Trump does it, well, then it's a different story. That's Completely. Right. I mean, it, the hypocrisy is amazing. Yes. The, the hypocrisy of the right wing and the Republican Party is just amazing yeah. on this right. issue. Right. If right. Obama did it, it would be terrible. If Trump does it, it's great. That's right. Uh, I agree. It's better to talk than not to talk, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we've long been urging and encouraging that uh, the trouble spots of the world need diplomacy. Right. We mm -hmm. need to, if we're going to advance peace, it has to come through diplomacy. It has to come, but, but diplomacy requires preparation and knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and that's sorely lacking here. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. Donald Trump doesn't know anything. No. He's a, he's a very right. ignorant man. And so what this ended up being was the Donald Trump TV show, right? Yes. This was, this was Donald Trump going to North Korea and appearing on television and, and so it was a spectacle. It was yeah. a media spectacle. But there was absolutely no substance there yeah. because Donald right. Trump did absolutely no preparation right. mm -hmm. himself. He has nothing at the State Department yep. be mm -hmm. because the State Department has been shredded. Yep. So there's nobody at the State Department that could prepare for this summit, which yeah. requires all those things that the New York Times mm -hmm. was talking about. Right. Right. So there's no expertise no. there. Trump himself is ignorant and doesn't prepare. So it ends up being this media spectacle, but nothing can happen That's because right. nobody's done any of the detail work, That's right? right. <laughs> and so it's all sort of left up in the air. So it's great to talk, it's great to have diplomacy, but diplomacy requires hard work yeah. and requires preparation. And this administration doesn't do that. Right. Uh, and so I'm not very optimistic. How can no. anything happen? How can, how can this process go forward? Yeah. Trump has no interest in doing that yeah. work. It, nobody at the State Department can do it. Pompeo is going to try, apparently, uh, but uh, you know I don't think the prospects are very good, which mm -hmm. is which is too bad because then the 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 real negative here is that okay we're not able to make any any progress on right. denuclearizing North Korea, so we fl slip back into the warmongering thing, you know, th right. the threats, mm -hmm. and so that's the dangerous part that. The attempts at diplomacy are great, but they're bound to fail unless these people do their homework. They're not going to do their homework, therefore we slip back into the warmongering stance. So, yeah. and, and that's very dangerous because we know how explosive Trump is, and he <coughs> talked about nuclearizing nuclear right. weapons before, and that's what scares me, that Kim doesn't follow through, and we don't even know what he was supposed to follow through exactly. on, and then Trump begins to look bad when people start saying, so then he gets on his horse and says, nukes, let's Yeah, get it was interesting there. how defensive Trump was. Oh, already about already it. Already, yeah. because people were attacking him. Well, how could you sit down with this brutal dictator? He's done this, this, yeah. and this, and Trump just kind of completely dismisses that. Right. Oh, he cares for his people. Exactly. He, he was young when he took over. He did a great job. I mean, it, it's, it's, it really ends up being almost ridiculous, yeah. the extent to which he's bending over backwards to praise uh, Kim at this point. But that could turn on a dime. That's right. That yeah, could, exactly. You know, he's such if a, he starts looking bad, then that's such an up and we're down all in trouble. personality. He could yeah. turn on that on a dime. So well, and let's not forget the other actors in the region. If you know, what does China want the most right. for us to get our troops out of there? Yeah. And yeah. right. That's so right. China maybe is the biggest winner out of all of this, right? Nothing too serious is going to happen, but the U.S. might withdraw some of its troops, and they might be able to. Uh, economically um, make their own relationships with North Korea, right, if some of those sanctions are lifted. Uh, Japan, I'm not so sure, you know, what they really win or lose out of yeah. this. It's a little yeah. uh, murkier. But I would just like to also say the other giant hypocrisy, as you guys both well know, you know, we, we have the most nuclear weapons. <laughs> 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 We're not willing to, you know, yeah, do anything right, there, right. right? We're still the good guys. Yeah, the well. same argument, you know, um, uh, in, th in theoretical position that we take a lot on this show of the American exceptionalism of you're the bad guy, 
Um, and in this case, it's interesting because Trump isn't even calling him the bad guy, <laughs> right? Right. 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 <laughs> You're yeah. also sort of a good guy, but you can't have nukes. Only we can have nukes because we're the only really ones who can do this. But that, uh, you know, the rest of the world is not uh, going to play along with that, I think, much longer. Uh, for me, the big contrast over the last couple weeks has been the North Korea summit and Trump's behavior versus the G7. Wow. And the trade yes. tariffs on our allies. Yes. And th that breakdown of relationships at the same time you're talking to a dictator, but you want to play uh, still the uh, leader of the world, the person who can make anything happen, right? Mm -hmm. And whatever we do, we can, we can leverage that. that. That's a scarier uh, world as well, or it's a world where America is, is totally isolated. Right. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. it, that, that notion, I'm going to throw out a big word here, hegemony. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The hegemonic uh, framing right. uh, mm -hmm. of the issue. So uh, hegemony simply means sort of a, a, a dominant power. set of ideas. So it's a form of power. Yeah. You, you can have coercive power, but you can also have right. power that's do where you dominate through ideas and beliefs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you frame issues. And so the framing of the issues means that only certain things are allowed to be talked about. Other That's things right. are completely off the table, never enter into the conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when we start talking about nuclear weapons, well, the focus is on, well, Iran might develop a right. nuclear mm -hmm. weapon. Okay, that, that can be talked about. Uh, North Korea has nuclear weapons, but they have to get rid of them, right? right. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we have right. 5,000, roughly 5,000 yeah. weapons, that doesn't, that's, you can't talk about that. Right. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're going to spend a trillion dollars over the next 10 years that's right. to modernize this fleet of nuclear weapons, that's not allowed right. to be talked mm -hmm. about, right? You yeah. can't bring that up in right. polite mm -hmm. company. And the mainstream media will not touch that, no. mm -hmm. right? That's, that's part of the framing, the hegemonic framing. Absolutely. Certain ideas are allowed to be talked about. Other ideas have to be completely left blank. And so, the, and the other issue for me here is, we had an agreement with uh, Iran, Iran yes. uh, yeah. which would have prevented them from acquiring a nuclear yes. weapon, which is the goal here, right? Yeah, that's right. Trump, Absolutely. Wants, Supposedly. Trump wants Korea to get rid of its nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. right? We had a very solid, substantial yeah. international agreement. Uh, a number of nations, powerful nations around yeah. the world had all entered into this agreement. It was going to prevent uh, Iran from, from building a nuclear weapon. And what's Trump do? He kills that right. on a whim. On right. a whim, because Obama did it. Again, with no, with no thought and, and no analysis, right. he just mm -hmm. gets rid of it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but, so now, how can he That's go right. to, so why would Trump, Kim trust him? You right. know, mm -hmm. If he does negotiate an agreement, well, because Donald Trump did it, right? That's right. If Donald mm -hmm. Trump does it, then it's okay. But if Barack Obama did it, right. mm -hmm. uh, but again, compare the two situations. Look at all the careful planning and negotiation oh, and analysis goodness. and yeah. bringing the rest of the world together to accomplish the Iran deal. Right. That was a that was an important and significant step that was taken Absolutely. by the international community. And Barack Obama and John Kerry should have been given enormous credit for mm -hmm. the careful diplomacy that led to that. Right. Uh, and now compare that to what just happened in Singapore. Yeah, it's right. like, you know, jet in, have a few photo ops, jet out, everything's Make a taken video. care of. The problem is solved. Right. <laughs> right. The, pro right. the, the, the North so Korea, sleep I well know. tonight, <laughs> Trump said. Yeah. Sleep well tonight, the problem is taken care of. Yeah. Well, and you, you made it, one of the other good points you made in there, Ron, was the international community. That's right. I mean, what Obama tried to do was try to get a whole bunch of That's people right. on the same page on this issue. None of that happened here. None of that happened here. No, and like I said, at the same time, we're dismilling, dismilling our, our allies yeah. and, and making, picking fights with them. Yeah. You know, Canada is mad at us. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. saw one of the quotes on you know Facebook that was you know getting Canada mad is like you know not getting along with a golden retriever. You know, <laughs> like it, it, it's, that's how bad it is, right? <laughs> yeah. And then. So then Donald Trump meets with Kim, who everyone knows is a ruthless dictator, yeah. and uh, comes back home and says, the greatest enemy is the press. Yeah, right. right. The greatest enemy. Uh, well, yeah, because that's about democracy. Yes. And that is his greatest Which enemy. Which is, yeah, a lot of the other things we need to talk and, about. And, and again, I want to point out that the mainstream press buys into this hegemonic Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. paradigm. So even, even there, they, uh, they well, have very narrow limits within which they will talk yeah. about issues or, or critique uh, the president. But even that's too much for this yeah, president. Yeah, exactly. Even mm -hmm. that uh, is something as, as a cause for him that's to right. attack. 
the press. That's right. Uh, again, you have to have complete support for everything Donald Trump is and stands for, whatever that is at the right. moment. <laughs> and if you don't, then you're an enemy. Exactly. And that includes uh, right-wing Republican Congress. Absolutely. Congress. You make one, you know, Mark Sanford found yeah. out if you make one <laughs> comment about Donald Trump that he doesn't like, he'll go after you and, and uh, oppose you in your primary and defeat you, even though That's nine right. times out of ten you're voting on his side. Right. right? Mm, right. Uh, it's a crazy world especially for Republicans, I think, right I now. Think well, what's scary is that his popularity among Republicans. Yes. Um, yeah. It's so high. They said that the only one who's been higher in recent history was George W. Bush after 9-11. Right. Mm -hmm. That's how high he is. But we're, the Republican Party, what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Bob Corker, Republic, Corker, Republican senator from Tennessee, said yep. it well. It's become cult-like. That's yes. right. It's become a that, cult that a of personality. Yeah. Yep. And if you dare speak out against uh, the dear leader, uh, you get attacked, yeah. and mm -hmm. even within the Republican Party. So uh, it would seem to me that this is a very difficult time for Republicans. And uh, just to go back to something we've said before in this program, the only thing I think that's going to bring about any significant change in our political situation is if the Republican Party uh, comes to its senses, right. uh, in a sense, if, yeah. Yeah. if the Republican members of Congress begin to stand up to Donald Trump, begin to uh, rebel against this cult That's right. and uh, insist upon uh, what used to be some very traditional Republican values that mm -hmm. they want yeah. to still support. And until that happens, until the Fred Uptons of the world, or, you know, again, it has to be yeah. more than Bob Corker and, and Jeff Flake. Who are right. not, retiring. Who are retiring, <laughs> yeah, so they feel <laughs> free to speak out. But, yeah. but yeah. again, look what just happened in that primary. So every other Republican sort of quaking in their boots. If I dare to speak out against Trump, I get attacked and then I lose. Yeah. And I'm out. So That's right. Mm. Uh, it's a very dangerous, a very dangerous situation, I think. It mm -hmm. is very dangerous. All right. Speaking of dangerous situations, let's talk about the Supreme Court. So yes, um, so <laughs> we had I a think couple of important rulings that came down from the court. Denise, we you did. Want to so take us through sure. what the court just so, uh, did. Sure. Um, so I think you know, Don, your segue of you know, it's about our democracy. That's what these things are really about. And Ron, that's your point as well. You know, if all if a lot of the different systems that we have in place, the rule of law and how parties work. If those things aren't working, then right. our democracy yeah. is, is breaking down, is at stake. And I would say one of the more partisan and upsetting cases, I, I think, for all voting rights folks is the Ohio um, versus Philip Randolph Institute case. So Ohio had decided to um, make some laws that if you yeah. did not vote, if you were an infrequent voter, right, which they defined as you hadn't cast a ballot in two years, then they would send you a little card to your house and say, you know, you haven't voted, so we're gonna take you off the rolls. So, and then two more years go by, you are purged. So what happened, and you know, talk about having a great plaintiff, you know, from the, in the legal world. A Navy vet, this guy named Harmon, comes back after two tours and hasn't voted. The card got sent to his house, but he's not there. You know, they're not forwarding that mail to wow. Afghanistan, apparently, right? <laughs> and he shows up to vote. He's been purged from the rolls and he cannot vote that day. So he decides to challenge this and he gets um, some other activists and voting rights groups on, on, his, uh, uh, on his behalf. Uh, this just went through, the decision just came out of the Supreme Court in of course a 5-4 opinion that upheld this Ohio voting purge law on the basis essentially that the 1993 Voting Rights Act, you guys know the 1961, right? There's a 1993 one as well. Uh, motor voter, a lot of things yeah. uh, got updated in that 1993 act. And it does you know, say that states have the right to clean up their roles, the, you know, the voting roles, they can do some, some different things. So a very narrow opinion that stuck to this um, very <laughs> vague statutory language said okay, it's okay for Ohio to do this with a couple um, caveats. It's more of a compromise decision. The court recommended that you have to send a return card. So it's not just enough to send you, hey, Don, you know, we noticed you didn't vote for a couple of years. We'll be taking off the, the rolls in two more years. It has to have a return card on it for you to mail back and say, no, 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 I still, I still live here. I'm registered, right? Because Ohio's assumption is that if you're not voting, you've moved. Right. <laughs> Which is what the other side has uh, said, you know, that's a really terrible assumption. How many people vote in this country? We know oh. very few, right? Yeah. Does that mean that nine, you know, 60% of the population moved? 
in 2018, 2016? No, right? A very small percentage of America actually moved, something like two or three percent. Right. Uh, so I would say there's two big takeaways. This is um, the Trump administration, you know, bef when this case was going through uh, the Court of Appeals and the lower courts, our Department of Justice was very much on the side of the plaintiffs and against the Ohio law for, you know, this would be voter suppression. This is going, taking it a little too far, guys. Like, we understand you want to keep your records straight, but this is removing people without enough opportunity to redress. And, and let's be clear, there was a very specific political moment. very specific They, they didn't do this out of clear. any concern clear. for yeah. democracy yeah. Mm -hmm. or right. concern for cleaning. They or did this specifically to, to suppress That's right. exactly. black voters exactly. in Ohio That's right. and young yeah. voters That's in Ohio. Right. That was mm -hmm. very specific intent of the Republican Party exactly in Ohio. Right. Yep. We don't want black people to vote. We don't want That's young right. people to vote no. because they vote Democratic. Right. Mm -hmm. So can we come up with a strategy to purge to, them, to purge off, them the off And here and it this is. This is the strategy they came up with. If you will, yeah. I cannot wait for classes to start so that I can read Sotomayor's dissent. This says exactly that. Mm -hmm. Right, and then this is a 5-4 opinion, so I would also have to go back to the idea, this is uh, Alito, Roberts, Kennedy, Thomas, and Gorsuch. Yeah? Yes, so, yes. You know, sorry I have to bring it up, but you know, here's our stolen Supreme Court seat at work as well. Yeah. So you've got two things at work here, a stolen Supreme Court seat that now gives you a 5-4 opinion like this, and the Trump administration also coming in. You know, the, there's a lot of research, the Solicitor General, the government's opinion on these things is taken very, very uh, heavily by the courts, right? So when the Trump administration reverses that opinion and sends in their amicus brief by our Solicitor General that says, no, 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 this looks like it's legal according to the 1993 statute, that weighs very, very heavily on the court and that is signaling to them what to do to be a good Republican, right? But Sotomayor's dissent is fantastic. I encourage you all to go read it. Um, because it says exactly these points. Um, and it really says, you know, our government's basically ignoring the whole history of voter suppression. This is, you know, she likens it to Jim Crow laws, because uh, who is this going to affect, right? So. I just, I wanted to, you give such a good analysis of this whole thing, but how out of step we are yeah. with the rest of the world. Yeah. I just looked at some statistics this morning, and it said 70% of voting age citizens in the United States were registered in 2016 compared with 91% in Canada right. um, this, and in the UK, 96% in Sweden, right. and 99% in Japan. Right. So their effort is to keep people from right. registering That's to right. vote and from voting. That's right. And we know that the turnouts are so bad because so many of the poor people say why that's why right. are we voting that's it's right. not working so if if i can keep people poor that's right then that's going to help me because those people are going to vote for me that's right. and so what you said it's in the interest oh, absolutely. of this party the republican party to keep these people from voting whatever way they yeah. can i think the research is also the academic research is very clear there's a true minority and socioeconomic effect Mm -hmm. from laws mm -hmm. like this. I mean, it is stopping them. So, no you know, w then we have to think, well, what's the impact of this, right? So there are six other states that have laws like Ohio, and this will only embolden, right, other states or yeah. parties who wish to maintain that sort of discrimination and voting. I mean, Absolutely. this is an attack on civil rights, as far as, far as I'm concerned, to, to go further. Um, but even in the United States, there are 15 states that we could follow. Michigan is not one of them. Uh, that have uh, voting day registration. Yes. Right? The, and guess what? The research shows those states a 10% higher turnout on election wow. day. Because I know I'm not going to get hassled. It's not this big, I might, I'm not going to get turned away. I can show up and uh, here's my license or here's my utility bill in some states, right? Like think about what it takes to get proof of a residency right. for right. all sorts of other things in your right. life, right? right? And go ahead and vote. We'll check that out and we'll add that to the rolls later, right? This, this then kicked out nine, over 9,000 votes in Ohio in the last election because of this. And Ohio is always a swing state. Exactly. So, so now you're talking about a yeah. swing state that 9,000 people, guess who most of them were, didn't oh, get to vote. Poor and people of color. Right. And, you know, again, the court, Alito's opinion sticks to the, the, there's one little out in this statute that says states have the right to do some of these, per, to keep their royals and records clean. 
right? And it's supposedly this big compromise that we have to do this return card. I don't know about you. you know, who's going to really pay attention to that? Wow. And mail it back in. And why should I have to do things in order to keep my supposedly unalienated rights? That is the real, like, talk about hegemony yeah. and the turn of the discussion that we can even have. This is my right. Yeah. You don't have any, I don't need to do anything to keep that right. Mm. No. Right? Is, no. is, should be our position on this. Yeah, the whole theory of democracy is, is government by the people. That's so we right. should be doing everything we can to make sure that the people's voices are heard. Can be heard. And that 91 law was to extend. That's exactly right. And there were social workers very much involved in that oh, whole absolutely. effort to try to get that through. And it was helping. That's right. And Michigan, actually, a lot of that was Michigan. Was, I'm pretty sure the first state to do motor voter. And a lot of that 90, and that was back in the 80s and the 93 law is actually modeled on Michigan. We've since uh, become pretty <laughs> restric <Yeah. laughs> more restrictive in our border, which is why, um, right, in Michigan there's a huge uh, gerrymandering huh, organization and that's uh, passed a constitutional challenge to be on the ballot this fall. There's a promote the vote uh, initiative going on to change some of the restrictive voter registration and, and laws in Michigan. So it makes it why are we wanting to make it more difficult for people to vote, right? Because we can control the population that votes that way. Exactly. And that undermines yeah, our democracy right. yeah. more than, and, and our, maybe that's my political science, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, we have our, one of our own six district candidates is suing our current secretary of state over what it takes to be a qualified petition signature. Right. If you don't know right. that you live in the city of Kalamazoo as opposed to the township of Kalamazoo and you make a mistake on that, boom, you're out. Well, in, invalid, right? These are the kinds of little things that, yeah. you know, there's always a, a, you know, yes, bureaucracy and I want to keep good records, but we should never make the citizen huh, wow. be Great. held re responsible for obtaining their own rights exactly. like that, right? Exactly. That's the state's job to uphold the basic fundamental rights. So, so that was kind of a big one um, that will have some unfortunate uh, re repercussions. Uh, the other case that I would also argue is an attack on civil rights is the Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado. Uh, this is a 7-2 decision, so maybe not as highly partisan, um, uh, but still in, in that vein, right? This is the uh, baker who denied making a wedding cake to uh, a same-sex marriage couple. And really the court ruled on a very um, narrow version of this again, and they won on the argument, the baker won on the argument that the state of Colorado was too hostile and discriminatory to the baker in their taking up of this issue, right? So the same sex couple goes in, no, he doesn't want to make the cake, um, but turns out the baker will make you a cake for almost any other situation. So it's not that he's denying all sexual orientation customers, right, or all blacks. He'll make you all sorts of other cakes, just not a wedding cake, because that's his religious mm -hmm. belief, right? And, and this goes, you know, all the way up to the state of Colorado. Colorado says, no, you have to do this. This is discrimination, blah, blah, blah. And so he decides to file. And again, Trump administration supports this. Our Solicitor General argues this case in favor of the baker. I mean, that is just huge in yeah, my, right. my opinion, exactly. um, but they don't really, the court does not really discuss religious liberty. It really all hangs on this idea that, well, it's not that he's not serving everybody. It's just in these particular situations that he won't make this particular cake um, for you. I really don't understand how that's so much different than the 1960s cases uh, and the, the no. discriminatory, like um, the right. piggy pork barbecue what was there. They also claim religious uh, reasons for not serving uh, black people, right? So, so <laughs> this is so another blow to civil rights exactly. and discrimination. And yeah. it's, it's this overall kind of idea that I, the dominant group, <laughs> we've talked a little bit about status being a reason why we support Trump, right? Me, the dominant white male heterosexual Christian, huh? I'm the one being abused here, right? Because yeah. some I'm losing some of my status, and I'm going to have to like get along with people that aren't like me. And he wins basically on that argument when you go below it a couple layers, and that is disturbing, right? Right. So, yeah, so, and again, I don't want to say that that's a narrow technicality, but that's yes. that's uh, uh, the the main issue got sort of sidetracked. Totally did. Totally right? did. So let's say that today. Um, a same-sex, 
couple goes to this baker right. and asks him to, to do a cake for their wedding and he right. refuses and they file a lawsuit against him. Right. The state of Colorado doesn't butt in and, yes. and screw things up right. by their by being hostile, so mean. <laughs> by being you know, so mean. Yes. And it pattern, comes back to the know, court. Yeah. Just Maybe. Hmm? Would it, it leaves would there open. Would be a different outcome? It could be, and that's is where a lot of the legal scholars are really kind of upset with the court for not addressing the real question they didn't address here. The, the main right. substantive. No, We've gotten didn't. no more clarity on whether religious liberty can be used in these situations ever. It really rested on the idea that this guy was treated so badly by the state of Colorado. Poor, poor and, fellow. You know, you can read, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you can look at all these, you know, it, it, it's very strong language. It says, you know, you must do this. Um, but, you know, they're arguing, well, that I wouldn't want a, 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 a Jewish person to have to bake a cake for an anti-Semite that had some swastika on it. This is encouraging more tolerance and freedom. But the issue to me, right, is we haven't addressed the inequality piece, right? Who has all the power and the privilege, right? Mm -hmm. we, we need to protect the people who do not have the power and yeah. the privilege and are the minority, and that should always be our de democratic mm -hmm. stance, right? This exactly. does just the opposite. Exactly. Right? Yes. It allows me a little wiggle room to not protect the weakest among us. Yeah, right. So right. there still has exactly. not been a Supreme Court case that has actually addressed substantively this concept, and I think no. it's a phony concept. Yeah. I think it's a totally phony concept yep. of religious freedom. Well, that's why yeah. the, that's why yeah. Colorado got in so much trouble. So be careful. One of the things that they said to this guy was, "We don't really buy that you're all like super religious, and this is so offensive to you. We believe this is a guise for discrimination." And that those words are ones that the court really hung on to. This, well, you don't believe, look how religious he is, and you don't you can't say that to someone and question their religiosity. Uh. <sighs> But, but okay, but so to me, the concept of religious freedom as the Catholic Church and others are trying to push mm -hmm. it is, is that because I have this sincere religious belief, right. that allows me to discriminate against that's you. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not, that's not the case. That's nope. not the law. No, it is that's not. That's not the law. And so I have the freedom to practice my religion. That's right. I can go to church. I can do whatever. I, that's I mean, right. So mm -hmm. I can, you know, the government can't interfere with my ability to practice exactly. my religion. Mm -hmm. But if I go into the public That's market, right. and now I say, well, my religion allows me, I can impose my religious values on you. The, That's exactly the government right. has to allow me to be a, a bigot. The government yeah. has to allow me to be a bigot and discriminate against you based on my personal right. religious beliefs. That's, That's, right. That's, That's right. not the law. That's not the law, that's, I know. and that's the issue here. That's exactly yeah, right. It's it still not been addressed. Here. And it hasn't been addressed by the court. So I think that um, on the legal side, um, folks should be continuing to bring these cases, and they need better case facts, because this was really a narrow decision about these very, very specific case facts in this situation. It does not address a lot of doctrine, right? we got to bring a lot more cases like this yeah. and, and, and see where they might go. And I would also argue that this is going to be the conversation of the next um, 10 years. How do we deal with this changing of the status and the dominant population in America and make those folks feel <laughs> secure enough about who they are while at the same time this world is absolutely changing and they won't have that control anymore? That's what the voting rights cases are about. That's what these, all these things are about to me, right? Or this conversation of the white Christian guy is losing power. Yeah, He's is, losing yeah. control. Yeah. Yeah. So what are we going to do? How are we going to have that conversation that you're still going to be able to be a good Christian, right? And these other things are going to exist and, and you're going to live with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I, and I think, again, in terms of the political framing of yeah. the issues, uh, to frame it as an issue of religious freedom, is, as if somehow the government is now forcing you or inhibiting exactly. the practice of your religion. Yeah. Right. That's not the case here. I know. Uh, and no. so that's that's a, uh, a, a misdirected framing Agreed. of the issue, uh, because your sincere religious beliefs do not allow you to be a bigot. That's right. Do not allow you to discriminate against other people. And so, if you if you're a baker and you don't want to bake a cake for a gay couple, then you just don't be a baker. That's right. Because <laughs> if you become a baker, you're now entering into the that's public right. market, mm -hmm. and now 
you can't discriminate against That's people. Right. No matter what your religious beliefs are, yeah. you're not allowed to discriminate yep. against mm -hmm. people. So if you don't want to do that, then don't be a baker. Go find another line of work uh, where you can be a religious violent. bigot only, to your heart's delight. You know, right? We, right, only <laughs> work for your nonprofit private church. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, right? to cast I mean, this as an issue of religious <laughs> freedom because the government is not uh, in interfering with the your right ability to practice. for people to practice That's their right. religion in certain ways but again right. we, it becomes totally different when you enter into the public market That's right. and there are laws oh, yeah. that govern practices and so I, right. I hope the court comes back I hope we this. get some, we some get better another. cases and we bring them because again this but argument again, that I me with all of my privilege that I'm the one being abused in this situation is just uh, is a ridiculous thing to support mm, right, right. Mm. right all right uh, yeah, I know well We've, we're focusing a lot on civil rights issues. By the way, did you want to talk, uh, uh, go back to the WMU We Vote? So I just, um, uh, I, yeah. if, 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 I think there'll be a, a very, a much better orchestrated uh, campus, Western Michigan University effort to uh, register, educate, and turn out students this year. And uh, we are really focusing on some of our local elections and issues that will be our, our ballot, uh, like the gerrymandering that is going on, uh, voters, not politicians. This is all tied into that same idea of the, the fabric of democracy, and along with some of the promote the vote and some of the hurdles uh, to student uh, voters. For example, Michigan has laws uh, you have to register in person the first time, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the first time voter, if they are first time college student as well and you just actually turned 18, right, where you have to register in person, you have to vote in person mm -hmm. that first time. And that makes it even more challenging mm -hmm. for our young folks to, to get out, right, and to understand what's happening. So we're really hoping to hold a lot of forums this fall and have some guests on this show that can talk about those rights right. and some of the challenges and strategies and some of the things we might think about wanting to change here in Michigan, right? Our own representative Hoadley has, has, has introduced legislation around gerrymandering. I think there is a lot of work to be done in our own state on our own voting rights and civil liberties. All right, we will definitely. So we'll get back to that we'll one. We'll definitely yeah. come back. Thank to the, the gerrymandering issue looks like it's going to be on the ballot unless the Michigan they Supreme pass the Court constitutional challenge steps in. I, well I think now uh, the Supreme Court could step in the legislature option I think is out they passed a budget yeah. and so, they're home for the summer right so yeah. I don't see them calling a special session okay, just to so deal with this. It looks like it'll be on the ballot yeah. and oh. if there's of course the Wisconsin case is pending before the Supreme That's Court so right. a lot of things happening on gerrymandering so we will devote a specific show Good. to that. Yeah. Good. All right done. I want to bring you in because okay, I yeah. know that uh, the talking city, about, talking about civil rights inequality. issues and inequality issues, I know the yeah. city has been working very, very hard to try to address the issues of poverty and economic inequality in the city. What's happening? Well, What's, I, think, uh, I think you I got think, a big meeting coming up. As a yes, we do. Uh, a week from Monday on uh, what's that, the 25th, um, we will have a special meeting at City Hall to June try 25th. to. June 25th. And, um, it's open to the public, of course. It's a public meeting, and what we want to do is bring the community up to date on where we are with our efforts in what we're calling shared prosperity, mm -hmm. that everybody in the community. But it's important to realize the context in which we're doing this. Mm -hmm. And uh, just this week, um, a man by the name of Philip Austin, who was the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, just completed a study mm. of the United States. Mm. And um, he was looking at poverty, and especially at extreme poverty, which is half the poverty line uh, in the United States. And his, it's a scathing report. It is a scathing report. He talks about how the United States is um, the leading country in the world in inequality, mm -hmm. the richest country in the world. But the other point that he makes really important is that this is, this is re result of policy choices, that policy choices are yeah. there. And one of the important points he makes is that the United Nations has signed on to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also signed on to um, the Declaration Against Racism. They are the only, we are the only country in the world that has refused to sign on to the Declaration of the Rights of the Child. The only country in the world. Wow. So even though we've signed on to these um, declarations, 
And um, these declarations include, when they talk about rights, economic rights. The United States refuses to recognize that economic rights are uh, human rights. In practice, they refuse to do that. Um, and he makes a lot of very important points in here. And one of the important points he makes now is a child born in China today has a better life expectancy than a child born in the United States on average. That's striking. Mm -hmm. That is really striking. So he's looking at that. At the same time that that's happening, there is a movement uh, to revive uh, what Martin Luther King was doing at the end of his life, which was the Poor People's March. Yes. Reverend William Barber has been leading that. Um, and they've been doing this a 40-day um, time of action, which will culminate on a, a week from tomorrow, the 23rd, in Washington, D.C., with, a, with a, a large demonstration there. And, and their, their whole idea is to remedy what Philip Austin is talking about there. So that's the context in which we live here in, the, in this city. When we look at what's happening in this city, we're out of step with the rest of the country. Because when we look at some of the statistics about poverty in, in this city, 32% um, of all our city residents live in poverty. When we look at other cities, 65,000 population and more, we're in the 97th percentile, the 97th percentile. When we look at the poverty rate among black residents in the city, 41% of um, black um, citizens in this city are living in poverty. And when we look at uh, children in poverty, the statistics are even worse um, because 52% of our black children in this city live in poverty. So one of the things that we've been doing is looking at the issue of social mobility. How many kids who are born in poverty mm -hmm. um, get out of that as they get older? And there's, a, there's an economist named Raj Chetty who's done a number of studies on this. And he's looked at 26 years of, of records. And he's taken people that, were, when they were born, that were in the bottom, and 26 years later, how many of them moved out of poverty? Mm -hmm. So when we look at some of the, uh, we were looking at another county in Michigan, I can't remember which it was. And when they looked at those statistics, 25% of those kids were in poverty, that were born into poverty, were still in poverty when they were 26 years old. In Kalamazoo, 40%. 40% of the kids that were born in poverty when they're 26 years old are still living in poverty. So we got a lot of work to yeah. do. So we're looking at best practices around the country. We're focusing on uh, three levels. We're focusing on children and the supports that they need. We're, we're looking at families and trying to make sure that they get the, the supports that they need to get out of there. And we're looking at living wage jobs. And um, it, it's a, it's, we have some money because mm -hmm. of the Foundation for Excellence mm -hmm. to do these things. But we want to make sure that we're putting the money in the right areas. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're being careful of. But I have sort of a patient urgency about this because this is going on right now. Yeah this poverty, and these kids are hurting right. terribly right now, but we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So we're moving forward on it. We're not moving forward as fast as I would like us to move forward on it. But we're doing some things around housing. Um, the local initiative support corporation, we're partnering with them because we know that almost a thousand of our, element, of our kids in the public schools are living homeless. So yeah. we're working on that. We have a very extensive uh, summer program for young people. Uh, we're going to have 350 kids that we're going to have not only working, but we're working on literacy with them yeah. and um, working with the school, uh, the school board on trying to promote literacy with them. Um, we're working on trying to do something about job training. We're working closely with Momentum trying to get people that have been out of the workforce back into the workforce with the skills that they need. 
working with KVCC on that. But there's a lot of work to do, but it's such important work, mm -hmm. and, and we're going to keep going on that. Yeah. I, I really, um, it's shocking, oh, it's you know, and it's, uh, I was, there's a big report, you know, they always come out with the best and worst cities to live in, and maybe this is one way to get some other leverage and attention. Kalamazoo is on the list of some of the worst cities now. The who, 50, who did that report? I would have to look back. Yeah. I think it was I heard Wall it on the Street radio, Journal. Wall Street Journal. So, but they uh, do so these things, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, the 50 out of the 50 worst cities to live, Kalamazoo is now at 37. And one of the big reasons was the poverty rate. Mm. Poverty and rate it's is not terrible. something that I really realized until I came because it's a very segregated town in some ways, right? right? right. It, right. it can be very hidden. It's very hidden poverty to to folks who don't don't understand that. So. You know, and, and the other indicator was environmental quality because of our air and the coal and factories and where we get our power and things. So maybe getting that some sort of unfortunately yeah, negative attention. Pretty. Yeah. You know, that we want people to come to Kalamazoo, right? I'm pretty sure Western Michigan University wants some students <laughs> to come this fall. And when they when they hear stuff like this, uh, and crime was the other thing, right? right. So right. these are these are all interrelated, as we know, uh, issues. And and the link to, to education is is of course huge. Because I know you also probably do still serve on the board for communities and schools. I do. That's why I'm going uh, this afternoon for a strategic planning <laughs> of session you with are. them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, some sort of organizations to bridge that gap. Because the other thing that I was reading is, of course. Um, we have this huge percentage of homeless students and the pay for lunches, right? The, uh, yeah, so because the we state. have this huge poverty issue. Um, and of course, those kids end up doing really, really poor in school, right? right. And, or they have to miss a lot of days because uh, they can't, they have no place to go do their homework at. Uh, it's, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We really need to work on it. And we, we, one of the things you mentioned before, Denise, we know that one of the things that keeps people in poverty yeah. is the neighborhood is, that they live in. Yep. If they're living in a neighborhood, that is um, has more than 30 uh, percent poverty yeah. mm -hmm. and we have three neighborhoods that are certainly in that yes. position it extremely limits the, the the possibility of those kids getting out of poverty right mm -hmm. so we're not even uh, almost no one is 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 succeeding is getting out of the poverty trap in Kalamazoo if you started at 50 percent and you said 40 percent are still there at age 26 yeah. Almost no one then is escaping that here in Kalamazoo. That's unacceptable. We got to turn that around, yeah. and we can. And there's great. I would say that there is great uh, will in this community yeah. to do something about this. Yeah. Uh, I think it's as you said, it has not been put out there. It's I not been so. on the public agenda. Now it's very much on the public agenda, mm -hmm. and there is a a strong, strong determination that we're going to change it. Mm -hmm. And possibility of some resources. That makes all the difference in the world. That can help right. to yeah. uh, work on these issues. Yes. Uh, Don, what if there are people who are, are going to watch the show and, and they're concerned, uh, they're in the Kalamazoo area and they would like to be involved. They hadn't really heard much about Citizens for Shared Pro Prosperity yet. Uh, what could they do? How can they get plugged in? I How think one of the most important things that they could do would be to um, volunteer at one of the social service groups that are mm. working on this. You mentioned communities yep. and schools. Communities and schools does a tremendous job and, and they can use all the volunteers they can get yep. to go into the school and just sit with a kid and read with the kid or just be mm. a friend to the kid. Mm -hmm. um, it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. So I think that's that's the first step is look mm -hmm. at some of these groups that are that are already doing stuff, and and volunteer with them. Um, the Urban Alliance is looking for volunteers in the Edison neighborhood. The Douglas Community Center would thrive on them. Mm -hmm. The Mothers of Hope love to have people involved, and mm -hmm. and people can give their talents. One of the things that Mothers of Hope is doing is. Um, they're trying to work with kids on, on music. Um, yeah. um, and and we, had, we were given a beautiful piano and um, we're giving kids piano lessons. One of the things I didn't know was that if you want to be in the band at, at uh, Kalamazoo Central or Narx, mm -hmm. you have to be able to pay like $25 yeah. for insurance yes. for the, the instrument. And that keeps a lot of kids out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. So by just uh, donating uh, that little bit of money to those kids could make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of room here for, for people to, mm -hmm. to step in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for working on this. Sir. We got a lot of people working on it. Yeah. Yeah. And a uh, shout out to Tim Reddy and the oh, Lewis yes. Walker Tim Institute for 
uh, study of ethnic race and ethnic relations at Western. Uh, this is Tim's report here. Yeah, this is and, Tim's report. Uh, so one of the things I should mention is that in the near future, we've been working with Bob Miller at Western, and in the yeah. near future, there's going to be a joint declaration between the mayor and Western that Western is all in with partnering in this whole shared prosperity effort. Excellent. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, so we have a, a little bit of time left, and I know we had kicked around the idea of also talking about some other children who are yep. in great oh. distress right now. So uh, moving from the local level uh, to what's happening at our borders, uh, Denise, yeah. uh, what's happening? No. Why is it happening? It, it's, it's an abomination. <laughs> uh, yeah, think, well, and it's, it's interesting, um, a lot of the admi current administration will go back and say, oh, we're just following the law. Huh. This is, this is, you know, the law allows uh, us to do this. It's much like the court, I just talked and to you about. Also. And the Bible also. And the Bible also, you know, uh, you know religious and, Jeff but it's these very, very narrow interpretations of law in the books. And it's like, well, yes, and other administrations, the previous administrations chose not to do an immoral practice that yes, might be legal. <laughs> Right? <laughs> That's what we're really dealing with here. It's, and it's the same fundamental question to me of status stuff, the other, and, and making this work as, as a power, I'm sorry, racist agenda, right? That's, yeah. that's, right. <laughs> that's what's going on here. And it's a practice by, by separating children from these families. That's it's right. doing enormous uh, psychological damage to oh, these children. Yeah. There was yeah. a report on NPR this morning uh, about the uh, the trauma, the toxic oh. uh, shock of, of these separations right. mm -hmm. and how that just you know right. also produces physiological changes within the bodies yes. of these children. The, stress. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the toxic stress uh, right. mm -hmm. that they were talking about. So. Uh, and then for, for sessions to kind of hide behind oh. uh, some obscure <laughs> biblical of the law passage to, to justify this, let Gosh. alone to some, uh, you know, uh, legal status. Cause, and, and Trump keeps saying, well, the, you know, have, we have to do this by law. The Democrats have to change. Well, no, this was a This, this was has a always been this. This is a policy. Made by the Trump administration exactly. to start yeah. doing this. The law yeah. existed under yeah. Obama. It yeah. existed all the way back to GW it wasn't, in this form. It wasn't and done. other folks have chosen not to do this particular practice yeah. because it's immoral. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There are other standards that, that we could choose to be, behave on, right? And again, this goes right to the core of our citizenry and our ability to function as a democracy and to bring folks in into our democratic way of life. That's, that's what folks want to be able to do, and we're, we're kicking them out. We're kicking them out for that. Well, one of the things to me, um, I'm kind of encouraged by the, by, the, by the backlash. Yeah. I mean, it shows that there is a common decency here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Catholic bishops came out real strong. Yeah, um, a, that's a, true. A, a Protestant ministers are coming out real strong. Yeah. I mean, people know you don't take kids and rip them out of their parents' arms and take them away. I, I mean, there have been oh, there's a, uh, a statement by over a thousand uh, uh, counselors and psychologists saying what you said, Ron, that yeah. this is doing lasting harm to these kids and there is no justification for it. Right. So, but the, here's the other thing. Okay, their big thing is we got to keep these people yeah. out. We can't do anything about it. We, yes. we got to keep on the mic. What's going to happen yeah. when climate change That's right. starts going on and the 60 million refugees that we have now become how many refugees? That's right. mm. And we're going to just put up walls and keep them out of here? I don't think so. That's well, right. Already a good number of these people are climate refugees. That's exactly right. Mm. Uh, and so it's only going to get it's only going to get worse. Right. And, mm -hmm. and some of the, the people that are being handled in this way are people who are seeking political asylum. Exactly. That to, they had exactly. to leave because of the severe danger. And if we refuse them asylum and send them back, they almost certainly will be yes. killed. Yes, yes. Right. Uh, and, and, uh, and yet we're stopping those people and arresting right. them and stripping mm -hmm. their children from them who are simply trying to well, they're flee all in a tolerable situation and, uh, and trying to apply for a political asylum. It's just, 
it's a moral abomination, yeah, this yeah. policy. It really, really is. And it's a refusal to look at the fundamental reasons. That's right. Why are these people leaving? That's right. And, and the only answer to deal with that is an international issue, yeah. which is the exact opposite of America first. That's right. We have to t solve these problems together, but it's the exact opposite of what this administration wants to do. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, we just have a couple of minutes left. I, I also want to uh, call to people's attention something else that's going on at the state level, and that is there's a, an effort by oh, yes. uh, a group of right-wing politicians to uh, change the social studies standards for Michigan oh, K through 12. Oh, and uh, this to me is also an abomination uh, because the changes that they're trying to make, I think in every case, are a distortion of history and a distortion of scientific evidence. Absolutely. Uh, and meets with some ideological and religious agenda that they want to impose upon our school children. Yep. And uh, so, for example, they're uh, reducing references to the KKK as yep. a terrorist organization and stripping out the historic role of the NAACP. Mm -hmm. So this is overtly racist yep. to, to do this. Yeah. They, they want to eliminate references to Roe v. Wade and yep. eliminate references to gay rights. They're trying to strip out any reference to climate That's change right. mm -hmm. in there. Uh, yeah. And uh, even this, this one state senator even wants to strip out and has stripped out the statement that says core democratic values because yeah. he says that's partisan. Now this is democratic with a small that's d, right. <laughs> referring to democracy uh, and democratic right. institutions awful. and democratic values. But because it's democratic, it could be interpreted could be. as supporting the democratic parties, but it has to be stripped out of there. Oh I mean, God. that's the level of stupidity uh, ignorance. Uh, and yeah. ignorance yeah. That, that's going on in this process. Yeah. And uh, so there's not much time left. By June 30th, uh, the, the public comment time ends. And wow. so people, if they want to comment about it, I think this is an abomination. Absolutely. No Democrats were allowed to participate in this process. No progressives oh, right. were allowed. It was right-wing Republicans uh, all the way who were trying to really dramatically change and alter the social studies standard to fit a narrow political and ideological agenda. And in doing so, they, they again, are distorting history yeah. and ignoring scientific evidence. And I think that's an abomination. If you want to comment on this, you can go to the website of the State Board of Education. There is a, a place for public comment. There will be yeah. some uh, comments held around the state, none of them in the Kalamazoo area, ah. unfortunately. But you can go to the State Board of Education website, Michigan State Board of Education, and you yeah. can make a public comment if you are offended by these radical ideological changes to the wow. social studies standards in the state of Michigan. And as a sociologist, I can tell you that most of this is uh, utter garbage. Exactly. Uh, uh, we need rubbish. you to write the new Howard uh, Zinn real history yeah. book, Ron, yeah. <laughs> so that we can uh, we all should. as professors can assign something else for everybody to read because they're not going to learn it now. All right. Well, we're right. at the end of our time for today. <laughs> so, uh, on behalf of Don Cooney, Denise Keel, John Provencher, who's our floor manager, Daniel Smith, and Larry Mahana back in the, the control room spinning the dials. Thanks, guys, for all the Thank great you. work that you Thank do behind you. the scenes. And again, we invite you to come back and see us again on Critical Issues, Alternative Views.